Thank, thank you, Kathy. Um, Bridget did a good job of modeling getting off the stage, so I'm going to use her, use her as an example. Um, I want to mention that um, this, this talk is being streamed live on DS106 Radio. Is it actually working? Which usually has about one and a half people listening, so... <laughs> for, those, for those of you listening, Mikhail, if you're there, uh, thank you. Um, I, this, the genesis of this talk really came when um, I got an email from Blackboard, actually, about... It must have been about eight months ago, and it said, we're doing this executive session and we're interested in people giving talks. And I thought, what could I talk about? I, and I thought, well, I could talk about the future of the LMS. Will it become extinct? They'll never accept that. And to Blackboard's credit, they were really interested in having a dialogue about, you know, really, what is the future of the LMS? And so I had a really interesting time at Blackboard World, had a great group, really interactive audience. And since then, I've been spending some time writing and thinking about it. And this corresponds really with a sort of Cambrian explosion of, of, of writing and interest in this topic. And if you go online and sort of search for blogs, there's probably been, you know, at least 15 or 20 really interesting reflections on this topic. And it's even gotten to some sort of pro-LMS, anti-LMS kind of things, you know, defending the LMS and so forth, which I think is, I, I think is actually kind of silly because I'm not pro or anti-LMS. And, and by the way, this slide is not intended to indicate somehow that LMSs are dying. And even if it was, remember that dinosaurs became birds eventually. So. But, I, but I found this picture as I was talking about LMS evolution or, or revolution or, or extinction, and I, I found this picture, and I love the picture. It's, uh, it's on Flickr, and um, it's Creative Commons. So what I want to talk about today, expanding on that, and then, and then the great thing is we're going to have a panel, and we'll be able to have a dialogue and, and, and really involve all of you, I hope. Um, I want to talk about some thoughts that have come out of my further thinking on this and discussions I've been having with people online and through blogs. I want to talk about some contradictions, some limitations, and maybe just a little bit about some futures. So the first contradiction I want to talk about is one that we all know about, which is LMS aspira uh, uh, aspirations versus LMS use. You know, we, we put a lot of time and effort and resources into providing learning management systems for our campuses. Um, and, and you look at what they can actually do. But we know that on our campuses, the LMS really is the new ditto machine. That, that's the number one use for it. It is a content repository. People use it to distribute information to their students. It doesn't mean other good things aren't happening in the learning management system. We saw some nice examples this morning. Course redesigns, making really intelligent use of the tools. Blackboard and others spend literally millions of dollars developing new tools in their learning management systems. Um, but to a certain extent, on all our campuses, we know, and if you talk to anyone who works with faculty and you look at what people are actually doing, or you talk to students, the number one use is a content repository. The, the learning management system is the new ditto machine. If you uh, look at the data from the eCar survey, which, by the way, I would recommend all of you read, um, it, I think you have to be an eCar member right now to read the whole thing, but it'll be available soon. I think it comes out of embargo at some point. Um, they asked uh, faculty how they use the learning management system. They had lots of choices. And by far, the single biggest use was to push out information. That's about 60% of the people who use the learning management system. To promote interaction, about 40%. To teach completely online courses, about 25%. And partially online courses, about 20%. So how does this compare with what you're seeing on your campuses? Is that probably pretty typical? And, and by the way, I, didn't, I don't have the numbers up here on the screen, but when they ask, do you use the learning management system at all, of the people who answered the survey, 85% said yes and 15% said no. And I'm going to come back to that 15% because it's a really interesting number. It actually has some sort of historical precedence that's interesting that it's come to exactly that number in their survey. Contradiction to love it and hate it, okay? So a lot of the discussion recently has been about the limitations and what we don't like about learning management systems. But the fact is, most people who use them like them. They're either very happy or somewhat happy with them. And, um, but the interesting thing is, who's the most satisfied? Um, and that is IT people. <laughs> IT people are pretty happy. And by the way, these numbers vary. There's no significant difference I don't know whether this is good news or bad news for our colleagues from Blackboard. There's no significant difference in their survey in what learning management system you're using. The numbers came out the same in their survey. But 
that's from, and now the, these numbers are from two different places and the methodology is a little different, so it's not clear they're exactly comparable, but uh, in the Educause core data survey, IT leaders, so which is generally, this generally goes to CIOs and directors of academic technology, and they were asked, you know, how's the LMS working for you? They actually asked, is your campus satisfied with learning management? And this are you satisfied? They said, is your campus satisfied? 86% said yes. And then when they asked faculty, about 60% said yes. Now that's 60% is either a good number or a bad number, depending how you look at it. Yes. Yes, there is a student survey as well. The numbers are probably closer to the faculty numbers. They're pretty high, actually. Mostly what you hear from students is, we want more use of the LMS. That's pretty consistent. In the, so there's a student survey as well that's been going for a number of years. And student satisfaction is reasonably high with learning management systems. And the biggest complaint is faculty don't use it enough. So, but let's suppose this is true. That's a pretty interesting disconnect between, between what those of us in the so-called IT profession are saying uh, compared to what our faculty are saying. So I want to talk for a minute about, minute about it from this model because it occurred to me that these numbers very well fit the famous Rogers model of diffusion of innovation. And in fact, if you look at the middle, it's 68%. That's kind of shooting distance from the 60% that's satisfied. So again, this is either a good news or a bad news story, if, depending how you want to look at it. I think it's actually a victory for many of us in this room that have been working for a long time because, you know, I don't know how many talks I've seen at, at Cal State meetings, at, at DAT, DAT meetings, DECI, EDUCAUSE, whatever. We've put this great set of tools out there for faculty. We can't get them to use it. We gave them cookies. We gave them... We had seminars, we had workshops, they won't come and learn to use it. Well, they're using it. They're using it. Most of our faculty are using the learning management systems. And we could, we could be snide and say, well, maybe they're not using them the way they should or up to, the, to what they ought to be able to do. But the typical faculty member now is using the learning management system and they're pretty happy with it. There's still the laggards in the model. And remember I said, remember 15%? So Roger's model is 16%. I think that we could all agree that's probably not a statistically significant difference. Those people see essentially no value to the learning management system for them because they choose not to use it. They tend overall to be more likely to be tenured faculty. They tend to be a little older. Um, they tend to come be clustered in certain subjects. But there's a significant number of faculty who say, to do what I want to do with my students, I see no value in using the learning management system and I choose not to use it. And then there's actually the group I'm kind of interested in, which is the early adopters. And I think a lot of the questioning of the LMS is really coming from those who more are in that early camp. And, and those of us who are in academic technology and IT offices, we tend to spend a lot of time talking to the biggest users of our technology. We're not typically going out and corralling people and saying, why aren't you using the LMS? It's more we have people coming to us and saying, I want to do this, this, and this, and I have trouble doing it in your learning management system. I need a different kind of tool. And so I think that's where a lot of the discussion and the kind of the vanguard is taking place right now is with those early adopters. And I think it's the most interesting space. So the contradiction, the third thing I want to talk about, and this relates directly to to I think why you see the vast majority of faculty reasonably happy with learning management system and you see some of the early adopters starting to question whether it's the right model has to do with, with whether we're talking about innovation and, and you know, as if you were at, any of you were at the Educause meeting, we had Clayton Christensen there, the man who made the word disruption popular. Is, so is learning management really disruptive technology? And the answer is no, it's not a disruptive technology at all. It's very much what you would call sustaining technology in Clayton Christensen's terminology. In fact, it's an example of paving the cow path. And most of you probably know this term. It means the cow has been walking for 500 years from one village to another, and we get asphalt, and now we pay, pave the cow path. So we've got a better cow path. And, and that's at, at root, and, and with due respect to a lot of really interesting innovation that's gone on in this space, at the core, the learning management system reconstructs what happens in the classroom and puts it online. And it's not surprising that they evolved this way because I want you to imagine that you're a CIO or maybe a director of academic technology or provost and it's about the year 
1998, which was when most of us started looking at these types of systems. And, and you hear two sales pitches, okay? And one is, I'm going to give you a product that will completely revolutionize the way your students learn and your institutions teach. Would you like to buy that? How many of you in 1998 would have gone down that road? That's a pretty brave road to go. You, you would have gone there. Well, Monterey Bay, I'm not surprised. Monterey Bay tried to do some of these things. But she would have, she, but she, she would have been. First is this, my product will use technology to make it easier to do what your instructors and students are doing now. The, the learning management system in, at its roots was modeled on a traditional classroom and that's why it's a course management system. It's about managing courses. And we can talk all we want about competency-based learning and experiences outside the classroom. It was never designed to do that. It was designed to replicate what takes place in a course. The course as a central organizing principle of a learning management system was the key to its success. That's why it caught people's imagination and why people bought it, but it's also its inherent limitation. So let's talk for a minute about limitations. So uh, it, it's, there's a few things, and I think the first two actually are largely being addressed. The first one is complexity and, and sometimes called clunkiness. And I think if you look at what Blackboard's doing and you look at what some of their competitors are doing, I think they're getting on top of that. I think they're making a much smoother, better interface, fewer clicks, more intuitive, more opportunity to hide the complexity, make it work more nicely for faculty and students. I think there's a lot of progress in that space. That problem's been recognized for some time. And we're getting away from this kind of instrument cockpit with, with a million choices and a million clicks that really doesn't serve most people very well. Um, there's the charge that the learning management system has only sort of a central set of tools, and if you want to add new tools and new pedagogy, there's no way to do it. Well, to a large extent, LTI is starting to address that. LTI, if, if you're not familiar with it, you should, you should take a look. LTI is the standard that allows third-party tools to be added to an LMS. So we don't have to depend upon any one vendor anymore to provide everything. I'm, I know that for a long time there was this kind of features race, and, and you know, one LMS added blogs, and other ones said, well, we'll add blogs, and someone else said, well, we should have wikis. We'll add wikis, and you end up with a whole set of, cust of tools built by each different vendor. They're all a little different, and probably none of them are as good as the ones that are being built out on the open market. Well, that's changed. You, you can now integrate third-party tools much better. It's still evolving. LTI is a way to go, but that problem is still being, is, is largely being solved. The one that I really see faculty rebelling against is this issue of a closed environment. And, and it's one that I haven't seen anyone in the LMS world really tackle. So th think of it this way. This is, this is how an LMS is organized. You're an instructor, you have courses, and your courses have students. It's a hierarchical traditional model, it's a classroom model. Each one of those spaces represents the class. You go in and you close the classroom door. And, and I started as a faculty member in 1988, and they handed me the books, and they said, your class is over there, go in, close the door, do your stuff. You know, that's, that was a traditional model. So courses in a learning management system are designed to be closed in space and closed in time. Closed in space because they're only available to the people in the course. And for those of you who have tried to add people that are not in your ERP system to a course, most of our campuses either say, no, you can't do that, or they have a workaround that's usually unsatisfying and difficult to manage. And if you're five weeks into the course and you say, well, I want to add this, this guest to my course for the next week because they're going to work with my students, very hard to do in most cases. Some people may have got better solutions, but that's what I hear most, most campuses, most faculty, not easy to do. Furthermore, what if you want to say to students, I want you to take what you're doing and share it with the world and get authentic feedback. I want you to put it out on a public blog. Well, a public blog and a course and a learning management system are very two, two very different things, and to try to interface those is not easy to do. And it's closed in time. The way most of us use the learning management system, the course starts, the students are enrolled, they come in, they take the course, they take the final, done. They lose access to the learning management system, they lose access to all their materials, their teachers are saying, don't forget to download those materials because you might want them later because once the course closes, it goes somewhere. I don't know where it goes, but I don't even have access to it. Again, could you try to fix that? Probably could, but that's, that's the model that's, that, the, that it was designed for. Just like a course 
that you took when you were an undergraduate, right? You took the course, you took the final, you went home for vacation, you came back, you started over. It's like you wipe your mind and start, start fresh. That's, that's the way that, that we're used to working. The irony, of course, is that this doesn't really fit with our very own rhetoric. And in fact, here's the beginning of the mission statement for my campus. Placing students at the center of the educational experience. Well, that model places courses and instructors at the center of the educational experience. It does not place students at the center of their own ex educational experience. So you can imagine, just as a thought experiment for, for a minute, that you could have a different kind of a system where, that was really built around the student. It built around the student and the student's access to different types of resources and interactions and tools. And so then a course becomes a temporary connection of a group of students and all their learning tools and the instructor with all his or her learning tools, they essentially form a temporary collaboration and communicate over the course of that time. But when they're done and that box in the center which represents a course goes away, the students go on and they still have access to all their materials and all the things that they've done. Again, people have tried to build things in e-portfolio type models that are kind of like that, but I think what I'm talking about is something a little bit different. And in such a world, it's possible one model is the LMS could be the tool that helps you do that. So the LMS could be the tool that's kind of the glue that helps you build these connections between students and learners. And in fact, I've made it very non-hierarchical. So in this picture, you can't tell who are the students and who are the learners, because I think that's the world we're moving towards. And um, so an LMS could be a tool that enables that. So let's just talk for a minute about some of the experiments that people are doing with some of the early adopters, and then we'll uh, move on to the panel. So one thing that really intrigued me was I was at, um, Chris Mattia and I were at um, the Sloan meeting, which is now called the Online Learning Consortium in Dallas last summer. And we heard Jim Groom, who's a very, if you haven't seen him, he's a very persuasive, very exciting speaker. And he talked about a project that they're doing at uh, the University of Mary Washington, which in some ways is a throwback for us to where we were before we had LMSs. How many of you remember tilde spaces, right? You could build your own website. You gave everyone a tilde space where they could build a website. Now, for those of you who lived through those days, you know that um, it wasn't real easy to do. It was very easy to mess it up. And um, so it, 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 people were definitely looking for something with an easier unif user interface that took less training. You know, teaching the typical faculty member in the humanities to program in HTML is not really a good use of their time. Um, they're, they're experts in their humanity, their field. They're not, they don't want to become experts in writing code. But over time, the tools have become much more accessible. And so what a domain of one's own does is it gives any faculty and any student who wants it or chooses to use it as part of their course a place where they can essentially have their own virtual machine, their own virtual web server, and they can build whatever they want in that space, given whatever restrictions you might have in terms of appropriate use for your institution. So Chris and I got very excited and we ran off and found Jerry and we said, Jerry, this is really cool. We want to do this. Would you help? And he said, sure, we'll help. And so this is the, um, the, the chancellor's office in their best. Um, we're going to give you presents rather than giving you puppies. <laughs> and, and so um, out of that, we developed our own version of it with some significant differences, which we're now piloting on campus that we call CI Keys. So this is up and running. We have what, about 130, 140 people using it? We, we came up in September and we've got now about 130, 40 people using it. We're calling it part of our academic technology think tank. In other words, this is not a production service that, you know, we, we pride ourselves on keeping our learning management system extremely reliable with tremendous help from Blackboard hosting. Um, this is much more of an experiment and um, we're looking for, right now it's an alpha, we're not even in beta yet. We've handpicked a few people to, a few faculty to launch this, um, but we've got a list. How many people, Chris, have asked to be on the beta list already? We've got a dozen faculty waiting for us to tell them when they can get onto this. And what it does is it lets them create their own online space that's completely under their control. They can format it any way they want. They can put any materials they want on it. 
And if you check with Chris later, he can show you some of the examples of some of the things that have been built. And we give the same thing to students. The students get this virtual space. Now, as a practical matter, what do they mostly do with it? They mostly run WordPress, because WordPress is the most access accessible way to get into this. But we're hoping over time, especially with the students, they may start experimenting with anything. They can basically launch any open source software that they want in this environment, and there are tools there to help them do that. So to, just to wrap up, I was going to show you a couple of quick videos that we made uh, just the other day that, that Chris shot of, um, and I don't know how to launch it with this, so let me go up there, of faculty just talking about um, what they're doing. And I don't know how easy this will be to hear. So um, let me play it, and then I can just summarize what she said. What's really funny, because I always thought that the IT people wanted us to use the LMS, and then like, as I follow... Chris and Michael on Twitter, and they're, they're always like anti, you know, or outside the LMS. Like, you know, that's pretty much like the theme of a lot, especially by me. You know, so it's, it's interesting that they're like, oh, okay, I guess we're allowed to not, <laughs> you know, be Blackboard centric. Or, you know. So this is, this is about faculty having permission to try something different. And I would, I would argue I'm not anti LMS, but. Uh, I am interested in alternatives, and uh, through social media, faculty following me and, and following Chris, they could see we were discussing these things, and, and they started to realize, oh, there are other things, and we're allowed to do them. There isn't really a rule that says we're only allowed to do all on online learning within the LMS. So I was really gratified to hear her say that, because we definitely want faculty to have permission to try things, take chances, and do something new to see what will work for them and what will work for their students. And then this is Cliff really talking about potential impact that he sees. And he's really, here he's really talking about this closed thing. Technology is going, this ability to handle digital technology is going to be important in whatever career they have moving forward. And as they change careers, which they will do, they will need to be able to take the technology with them. And the way we're set up right now with the learning management system, they're not able to do that. So that connectedness is just being stopped at that something. door. Think about, I mean, this could be ongoing conversations for years that they can participate in long after they've left that classroom. So he's talking about how the, the, the sort of closed in space time and also about how learning to use a learning management system doesn't prepare you really to use much else in terms of technology. Whereas if you learn to use more general web-based tools, you can take that knowledge and use it for other things. It transfers to other environments and then you can continue to use it over time. So I think I'm just about right on time. So um, let's invite the other speakers up. We'll have a panel. Thank you very much and look forward to further discussion, especially to hearing your comments.